Hi, my name is Peter Moe, and I am from Tourism Ireland's Nordic office in Copenhagen. Today we will be talking about an unavoidable must-do, something quintessential to experiencing Ireland, meeting locals, and synonymous with Irish culture. We will of course be talking about how to experience pubs in Ireland. Therefore, we are joined by Garvin Rush, owner of Dublin Tour Guide. Hi Garvin. Hi Peter, how are you doing? Doing good. So Garvin, before we start, I'd like to know what makes you an expert in how to experience pubs in Ireland? So I've been tour guiding in Dublin since 2009 and I've been giving tours exclusively to private groups since 2015. So you can imagine that over those years, I've received a lot of questions. You know, people in small private groups tend to ask a heck of a lot more questions than a group of 30 does, right? So I tend to get a lot of questions about the pub. And sometimes it's when I'm in the pub itself. Uh, in fact, one of the tours that we do is a private pub tour of some of the best local pubs uh, in Dublin. Uh, so I know quite a few things. Cool. What do you do on those private tours and pubs? Just if you don't mind sharing. Oh, well, we'll be just, uh, it's just observing the literature. No, there's a mixture of different things. Of course, we explore the great uh, tastes of Dublin, the, the craft beer. Uh, we go to a Guinness pub. We go to a literary pub. Uh, and then we experience Irish, traditional Irish music as well. So it, it, there's a great variety of, of things to experience um, during the pub tour. That sounds really cool. There, it sounds like there's a lot of different types of pubs. Like, why why are pubs so important then in Ireland? Why are there so many types? Why 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 pubs? Yeah, well, I suppose let's start with why pubs. Uh, you know, Ireland is a very interesting place. It's got a very interesting and unique culture, uh, and the pubs are a big part of that because. Um, way back in the day, the pub wasn't just your principal place for drinking. In fact, a lot of people come to Ireland and think the pub is where you go to drink. Uh, it's not. It's where you go to talk. And we do so much talking here in Ireland that we get quite parched. And it's just convenient that there is a tap of beer <laughs> nearby. So this is what pubs are for. They're from talking. And in fact, if you would look at a pub, let's say back in the 1950s or even before that, you could imagine that it functions partly as a theater because before you, you see real life drama and comedy playing out. And then it's also a bit like a cinema because you could, you know, hear stories, folk stories and mythologies. Um, it's a bit like a newspaper because you can hear gossip as well as actual real news directly from people. And then it would be a bit of a school for, let's say, the, the younger adults or even kids, because, of course, back then um, it was kind of like a livery, living room big enough to fit in several families. Right. So you would have the younger generation learning from the older generation. Uh, so it's it's more than simply a place to go to get a drink. And of course, it has been where Irish culture in a lot of respects has um, has survived and in some ways even thrived so it has become a, a an important pillar to and for irish culture that sounds fabulous i mean i'm you've made me really want to go to an irish pub now especially now i guess uh during lockdown here i know now that you don't just go there to well drink you also go to, there to talk to hear the news is everything you said there do you also go to there to eat or is it or is it just chatting and drinking? Well, yeah. Well, uh, kind of to answer your, your previous question is there are different types of pubs. And, and some of them are, are bigger pubs that actually have a kitchen where you can order a meal. Uh, you know, you have your lunch or your dinner there. Uh, generally, they're not open for breakfast. <laughs> some of them some of them <laughs> in Dublin are. Um, but that's a type of pub. And then you have kind of your small, traditional old man Guinness pub uh that's really what you're looking for as a tourist uh, as a visitor and then you have your you know your craft beer pubs so of course that's where people who are you know in their 20s or 30s or anybody who's interested in beer um likes to go and sample all the small local delicacies the small um uh, small brews from all around ireland and uh, then you would have pubs that would be as i said kind of a traditional irish pub 
Uh, of course, then you have your touristy pubs, and it's generally, unless you're local, it's difficult to tell which is a touristy pub and which is actually a, a local pub. You know, so you have that. And then in terms of the food, as I said, you know, there are quite a few pubs, increasingly uh, more and more pubs where you can get uh, your lunch or your dinner. Um, whereas in the past, the idea was that you pubs shouldn't serve food because, well, you need to go home to your family because your wife is, you know, making the meal and you need to get back. Obviously, this is in the past. So there was sort of a stigma against pubs serving food because they would dissuade the the man of the house from right, returning right, right. to his family. Having said that, those great pubs that you find in the countryside or even in the center of Dublin, there's a great one called Grogan's, will offer something just to keep you going, just to tide you over, um, which would be like a toasted cheese sandwich. So Grogan's is a fantastic pub in the center of Dublin. Uh, that does these toast cheese sandwiches and of course it goes it goes brilliant with with a pint of guinness or indeed anything um pint of guinness or a cup of tea really that'd be the kind of the two options i wouldn't like it to have it with anything else fair enough and uh, so that that's that's your top recommendation for what to try in an irish pub would that be toast and cheese well if you can get a toasted cheese sandwich brilliant but if you're going to a pub that actually has a menu uh then you know you can get the traditional dishes like uh, fish and chips of course you know that was a, actually a, a british dish but of course we have it over here uh bacon and cabbage and then okay. probably the most popular one is uh, irish stew which would have been traditionally a lamb stew but now it's a beef stew and often you'll see beef and guinness stew uh, so it, Ooh, you kind of get the impression well. that we're we're nearly hooked up to Guinness twenty four seven here. <laughs> Actually, yeah. Then why why do Irish people drink Guinness? Well, Guinness is is quite different from most beers. You know, I, I, I'm a big beer aficionado myself. Um, you know, I I love I love Belgian beers. I just anywhere I go, I love to try the the local brews. Uh, but Guinness is, is quite a bit different. Uh, Guinness has this thickness to it. It has this consistency to it. Uh, you don't drink it the same way you would drink a pint of cider or an IPA, let's say, where you would sip it. Uh, Guinness, you don't really drink it for the flavor. It's more so for the consistency or indeed the, the aftertaste that you get. Uh, so... You don't, you know, as I said, you don't take a sip of it. You, 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 you take a nice big gulp of it and then you set it aside out of your line of sight. Well, obviously not behind you, but to the left or to the right. So it doesn't get in the way of the conversation you're having with the person in front of you. So this is why Guinness is a brilliant Irish drink, because as I said, the pub is for enabling conversation principally, right? So you're having a conversation, you take a big drink, put it to the side, then you're back engaged in the conversation instead of looking at your pints and thinking about when you get to drink more of it, right? So it really helps conversation. And of course, after talking for a good five minutes, you do get a, good par a big parched, a bit parched, and it's the best time then to satiate that thirst with a great, full, creamy pint of Guinness. Obviously, don't drink the whole thing. But some people will finish a pint of Guinness in nine gulps, eight gulps, seven gulps, some extremists would say, or diehards, you know, some of the traditions will say seven gulps. <laughs> um, but that's kind of why, why Guinness is a bit special, a bit different from the other ones. Um, okay. So you really paint a nice picture there, I have to say. I, I know, I know I miss Guinness, but... I'm getting thirsty myself. Yeah. <laughs> But what would you, uh, what else can you try? I mean, there's bound to be more to a pub uh, in Ireland than uh, Guinness. Yeah, well, up until really the mid 90s, mid to late 90s, there wasn't much choice as far as beer was concerned. Uh, you, you did have Guinness and you did have the, the big guys, big traditional ones, many of which were going since the 1700s or early 1800s. Um, and 
you know, since the mid '90s, of course, partly led by the U.S., we have the craft beer revolution. So there's a lot of new craft beers and ciders. There's new whiskey distillers that have popped up, and um, thankfully, there's also a big surge in the gin making industry. Oh, uh, I love gin. So yeah, and it's it's great. The great thing is like if you wanted to set up a distillery you do have to wait at least three years before what you have in the barrel can be termed classified legally as whiskey so you know that's three years of waiting and so a lot of the companies make uh make gin which obviously can maybe be much quicker you don't need yeah, to three three weeks about from uh fermentation from start to uh to bottling i think in, is in that shelf. Your oh, I just, uh, no not not in i haven't made gin i'd love to try and make it though but uh Oh, but I, I, I do love gin. I do love gin. And I do love craft beers and cider. I haven't, I haven't really got to grips with whiskey, but I'm I'm getting there. It's so nice. And it's a bit more sweet Irish whiskey. It's not as peaty. It's, that it's a bit more relaxing to drink. Be, if you wanted to kind of simply say, what's the difference between Irish whiskey and American or Scottish whiskey? Uh, it is, if you just compare... The Irish and the Scottish Irish whiskey tends to be smoother. Most Irish whiskeys don't have that peaty turf taste, uh, mm. and they they tend to go down easier. Um, and there's a few. Well, I won't get into all the details about Irish whiskey and Scots whiskey, but uh, there are some great Irish whiskeys. Uh, Green Spot is a lovely one if you if you're not too sure about whiskey or which one you'd like. That's a lovely one to start with. Obviously, if you're buying green spot, like that. green spot, yes, yeah, okay. And you have uh, another great whiskey called Slane. So it's uh, it's from Slane County Meath, and they they make their whiskey using three different types of barrels. So they mature it in three different types of barrels. One of which is a sherry cask. Uh, so that's um, a slightly sweeter whiskey. So that's a lovely one to start on as well. And then in Good recommendations of, there. Yeah, they're really tasty ones. I'd love to mention more whiskeys, but <laughs> a short of time. <laughs> craft beer wise, if you're really into your craft beer, um, there's a brewery called the White Hag, and it's doing some really innovative stuff. It's creating a lot of amazing beers. Um, so it would be, in my opinion, the, the best brewery in Ireland if you're looking for something very interesting. But the great but thing that's is. In Dublin? That, uh, no, that's up in County Sligo, up in the northwest. Okay. Uh, so yeah, it'd be a bit of a trek to visit that. But uh, thankfully, they've been rather successful. So you can find their brews in uh, a lot of pubs in Dublin and, and other cities around Ireland. Uh-huh. Uh, but the best thing would be just to go and ask uh, the, the, the barman, just to ask the pub owner, ask whoever's there, can you recommend a great beer? Or do you, first question would be, do you like beer? <laughs> that, that <laughs> recommended. Oh, it's always good to have a reference point there. Yeah, I get what you mean. Uh, let's say we've we've had our beer. How do we pay? Is it pay directly, or do you have tabs, and do you tip? Yeah, well, those are good questions. They're pretty important because it, it you know, coming into the Irish pub is uh, it's a different environment, isn't it? And you're not sure whether you're supposed to, you know install yourself in a seat or go up to a waiter find a waiter does this pub have a waiter uh in ireland typically irish people uh well they they want to they want to get the beer as soon as possible because conversation could attack you and leave you very thirsty so you you don't want to be parched so irish people go right up to the counter and order their beer um and then generally take it and um you know, sit down wherever. Uh, so it, it's handiest just to order and pay in the one go. And that way no one forgets. Um, if you're a local, obviously you can have a tab, you can kind of be trusted, but you know, the, the experience in an Irish pub is such that, you know, the conversation might take you and, you know, seven hours later, you know, you don't want to be asked, here's the final bill. Here's the, you know, 36 beers you ordered you don't want that kind of situation um oh. of course in ireland people as i said they don't go to the pub principally to drink so you you won't find much drunkenness i don't say much drunkenness in irish pubs 
uh, people handle their beer pretty well, um, partly because traditionally people would have had a drink, you know, every day or at least a few days a week, you know. Um, mm. So I'll give you an example of, of the tipping answer. So if you were to go up to a barman and order three bottles of Heineken or, well, you're Danish, so let's go with Carlsberg, three bottles of Carlsberg, and he opens them and he puts them on the counter and says, you know, that'll be whatever, 15 euro, then um, then there's not much of a service involved there. And you can tip him if you want, uh, but generally it's not expected. Conversely, if you were to order three pints of Guinness and the barman says, go and have a seat, I'll bring them over to you. And, uh, you know, carrying three pints of Guinness is a bit more difficult than carrying two, let's say. And the great thing about Guinness is it, it, it's actually, it actually goes above the glass. So it looks like you're getting more than a pint. So the head, oh, because right. it's made from nitrogen oxide instead of just carbon dioxide, like most beers, the head has a dome shape uh, because of the, the thick, creamy head. Um, so yeah, if he comes over with properly poured pints of Guinnesses and sets them down in front of you, doesn't spill them, and then maybe even tells you a joke or a little story, then th there's a service, there's an experience, and you, you can tip them if you want. So okay. just to kind of think of the service. If you've got a waiter there, if there's food being served, then it's typically the same rules as in a restaurant, right? So you're tipping uh, ten percent if everything is fine, fifteen and more if the server was a good laugh and actually, you know, knew a lot about recommending beers or you know whatever. Yeah. Yeah. About if there's like beer. been extra good service, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so ten to fifteen percent for actual service and then for over the counter. No service expects it. It's yeah. really good to know. You actually you mentioned something there. I've heard that you shouldn't just go up and, and order Guinness and take it. It takes a bit more time to order Guinness. It's something about the perfect pour or perfect pint. What's that? Yeah. Well, Guinness have a particular way to pour their pints. So they instruct the barman to pour the pint in two parts. So they'll pour the first part which would go up to roughly around just a, just above like the Guinness sign. So really about two thirds of the way up the pint glass and then uh, set it down, set it kind of, well, in front of you, but not close to you, if you know what I mean. They'll put it on the bar basically. And yeah, then, so you shouldn't grab it then. No, they'll leave it there for roughly about a minute to two minutes or if they're busy, a bit longer. Uh, or if they got nothing else to do, a bit shorter, and then they'll top it up. And so, what uh, what is the official reason from the the Guinness Company itself is that the first part of the pour, you're getting just Guinness, right? Mm -hmm. Guinness and carbon dioxide, and the second part of the pour has Guinness, carbon dioxide, and nitrogen oxide, in order to give it that head. Oh yeah, that lovely foamy top yeah. that uh, so, kind of leaves you with a mustache. Yes, well, that's the aim. Everyone has to drink it in such a way that you you get a wonderful mustache. You know, the lovely the lovely white yellow foam just graces the the top of your upper lip. Uh, well, not the top of it. That'd be a really deep pour, but your upper lip nonetheless. So it's important yeah. to to be patient, and this is one great thing about Guinness. It kind of teaches you patience tells you to to wait you know good things come to those who wait it was one of their slogans in one of their ads and um and just wait and then you'll get it and then of course then you have to wait so you it's not just a case of oh it's been fully finished now i can drink it then you have to wait for it to settle so for all those gas bubbles to exchange to such a, a degree that the bottom the main part of the glass is black and the top part is is white right so you have to okay. wait so if it looks cloudy you still have to wait so by I this stage you'll get you'll be pretty thirsty you'll have earned it by that stage you can always have the you can already have the first part of your conversation there it's uh five minutes or something yeah it sounds like 
before you're uh, ready. So I get why you have to order up there straight and directly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As I said, you, you, you don't want to be caught parched. <laughs> Fair enough. So at what time would you recommend going to the pub then? Like what time of day or week? Is there any, what's the best time to go? Well, pubs in Ireland do not stay open very late. Uh, so you'll you'll definitely need to be there roughly around ten o'clock if you want to have, um, you know, a good few hours in the pub. Uh, so that's that's an important thing to remember. So you're you're generally kicked out of the pub before one o'clock, and sometimes with some pubs and some days long before one o'clock. Uh, so you're not going to spend the whole night in there, right? Oh, that actually, that's a different story. <laughs> but you want to get there early-ish, right? And um, that, then it's going to be lively. There's going to be a good bit of, uh, you know, noise, environments, a lot of yeah. great ambience. But one of my favorite times to go to the pub is uh, uh, shortly after two o'clock. So this is when okay. people have come and had their lunch and gone back to work. Um, but remaining in the pub are people like writers, right? People that don't have a typical job. And it's yeah. amazing to be there <clears throat> in the pub at 2.30 or 3 o'clock and there's nobody in the pub except except you and the bartender and you can just hear him rattling the glasses. And if it gets really quiet, you can hear echoes from last night's conversation coming out of the dark wooden panels in the pub. So that's a real magic time, especially with the afternoon sun coming in through the, the, the dark or even, you know, you can have some windows that are brown stained glass windows and they're bringing in this, this incredible light. So that's a wonderfully quiet time. And it's, it's oh, in yeah. some ways like a church. You do get into this, some sort of a meditative state um, because it's quieter than it should be. So you feel... You know, you can hear your your thoughts and some creative juices flowing within your head. So that's a wonderful time for uh, for writing down some notes, taking some creative ideas and jotting them down on on paper, indeed into your phone. But of course, it'd be great to go to a pub just with a piece of paper and a pen. So that's the good time to be creative. Then that's that's really good. That just sounds really lovely. I really, God, I do have to. Go to a pub as soon as one opens. <laughs> um, but but uh, you mentioned there that there were so early ish. You said that you normally also like to go to a pub. So that's not the two o'clock, three o'clock thing. That's when about six o'clock. I'm guessing. Well, as I said, after two o'clock is kind of if you want to have that experience of just being in the pub mm. in in that silence and just try to soak in a silent atmosphere which is it, you know something to appreciate in itself um and then you've got dinner time you know we generally have dinner roughly around six o'clock here so rather yeah. early and then people go to the pub after six o'clock so uh if you want to have um if you want to chat to a lot of people really you know after 7 p.m after 7 p.m and and then that's a good tip and and how how do i then approach an irish person if yeah. I want to chat with them. So this is very important, of course. It's one of the best things you should do in Ireland when you come and visit. You have to talk to the people uh, mm -hmm. because we're, we're famous for conversation, you know, because we have all these conversation stations called pubs sprinkled around the place, as I've mentioned. Um, but we're also famous for wit, right? So this ability okay. to tell a joke and to engage in banter, as it's known. So... A typical experience for a visitor would be if you go up to the bar and you order a drink and the fella sitting, da sitting beside you there who has been there for a few centuries looks like he says something to you. Now, if he is a few centuries old, you're probably not going to understand what he's saying. But let's say he is quite comprehensible and he said something. Now, generally, it'll be a way to test the water with you. So having a sense of humor in Irish is very important. So he'll okay. want to say something to you that will might, you know, you'll you kind of step back a little bit. You're like, well, what did he say? Did he insult me? So the key here is not to get insulted. You may feel slightly offended, 
uh, but always come back, always retort with something that is witty or equally offensive to the guy, right? So this is this is very important, kind of insulting each other because in Ireland, the person that insults you the most is your best friend, and that's how you know he's your best friend, right? That's how you gauge it. <laughs> Not, oh, he saved my life one time. Oh, he's the best man in my marriage. No, he insults me the most, so he must be my best friend. So there you go, kind of insulting each other is it's a term of endearment, right? It's a good thing to be insulted. Uh, it's worse that nobody but talks it's, to But you. it's clever insults. It's not... Yes, yeah. It's nothing brash or vulgar. It would generally be something witty and kind of um, subtle sometimes. Subtle, okay. And lighthearted or...? Uh, it depends. Depends on what time of the day, what time of the mood he's... What, what, what kind of mood he's in. Okay. So just, if you go up, just prepare to... Uh, just, just be aware that that could happen, and be ready. Be ready. Be ready. Okay. And if I wanted to approach someone myself, um, would that be the same way, or? Well, it depends on who you're who you're approaching. So, if let's say if you want to start a conversation with, you know, someone who's who's drinking uh, uh, what looks like a lager or what could be a craft beer, and you want to want to chat to him just ask you know oh what beer are you drinking or can you recommend a beer or if they're an older man say you know um what time did you get here <laughs> so just start the conversation like that asking asking for recommendations of course is uh, something that inebriated people love love they love hearing that right because they oh yes i can recommend loads of things for you i'm very confident so that's what i would suggest <laughs> It's a good tip, though. Do you have any any other tips for when people visit pubs in Ireland, or anything they should be aware of? Yeah. So, uh, if you're going to a pub because you saw an advertisement, that's probably a bad sign, uh, okay. because the real local pubs generally don't need to advertise. Uh, uh. So, if you're in, in particular, Dublin. Uh, you can get great pubs outside of the Temple Bar area. There's really only two pubs in the Temple Bar area that locals visit. Uh, so don't feel like you have to go to the Temple Bar area. There's great pubs everywhere, you know. So mm. something that's kind of down a little street that just kind of fades in. You wouldn't notice it. But, you know, when you see it, you're like, oh, wow, I could have walked right past that. Brilliant. I'm going there. And when you're okay. in the pub, of course, order something Irish. Don't just don't just get the thing you get back home. You know, have an experience, have an adventure, yeah. expand your horizons. Exactly. Yeah. Try and, something new. You're visiting. And the great thing is that you know, it's one of the very few native industries we have, so it needs your support. You know, so think about that. Um, get something Irish. You know. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, of course. What would you? What would your personal recommendation be for what to get? Oh, or what's well, like? What's your favorite thing to get in a pub? Uh, well, I, I think it, it depends. If if I'm in a pub with a great choice of of whiskeys or um, gins, uh, like Darky Kelly's is a great pub. Um, I I'd order one of them. Something I haven't tried before. And oh, what right. I tend to do is if I'm having a whiskey, I'll put a, a few drops of water in it and I'll also have a glass on the side uh, because, well, I mean, it, it can be a bit too strong for your palate to drink something that's over 40%. You can't really taste all the subtle flavors within that whiskey. Um, so that's what I would do. And, you know, sometimes I'm, I'm in the mood for a cider or sometimes for a beer. If I'm in a great old man pub, I'll order a Guinness. Um, if I'm the first in the pub, I'll never order a Guinness. This is the whole thing about the, the taps. So you want to make sure there's a good 100 pints coming out of that tap earlier in the day before you order your pint so that it flows better. Of course, this is partly, this is mostly folklore. This is just what people say, you know. So whether there's science behind this or not, we don't really care because it makes great story. 
And it's all about that in the pubs. That's right. Yeah. You got to be able to, to tell a good story and have a laugh. And uh, what would you recommend that people learn as an Irish word for pubs? What's the, what's the word that you need to learn? Well, of course, the, the most important word is slauncher. 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 Yeah. So slauncher. I like to think of the word lawn. Uh, of course, I have no problem remembering it, but just think of the word lawn. Now I add an lawn. S in front of it and you got slawn. Slon. And then start to say the word church, which is somewhere you should be instead of the pub, maybe. But just don't go past the, the slauncher. Season. So ch church yeah. ch yeah. slon ch slon ch slon ch. So if you practice wow. it like that a few times, you'll have that's a, a very very good way to do it. Yeah, because I like that. If you see it written down, you're not going to remember it because of course it it's spelled in Irish. So remember that way of saying it, and of course it's the Irish word for cheers. So when you raise a glass and you head it to your colleague and you say slauncha now mm. slauncha means health which is is hilarious because you know in ireland we do so much drinking to each other's health that we're the healthiest country in the world not, wow not true at all <laughs> oh, okay uh that's partly a, a take on one famous quote from brendan behan who said, I spent all my health drinking to other people's. All right. Actually, come to think about it, you, you mentioned literary pubs. Is that a big thing in Ireland? Is that, what is a literary pub? Well, uh, so I, I mentioned that pubs are one of the few <clears throat> traditional native industries that we have, um, because of course, Ireland was a rather poor country. And Ireland, you know, people kind of think of Ireland when they think about maybe they think of music and they think of literature and poetry maybe um, and this is partly because obviously we have a great musical tradition but in terms of literature if you are a creative type if you are a budding artist um, if you are living in 18th or 17th century Netherlands then you, you might become a painter right but in Ireland you know all you could afford was a pen you couldn't afford all the paints. You couldn't afford the canvas. So you got a pen. And so a lot of people who were artistic found their voice uh, through the medium of writing. And um, the pub, of course, has kind of become linked with a lot of writers because for some people, and for a lot of people, the drink enables the free flowing of ideas. It lowers your inhibitions. Mm. So it can kind of release some of those uh, creative thoughts interesting yeah and we have a few pubs in dublin that are directly linked to uh writers like like patrick kavanagh who's a great irish poet um so it, it'd be a great experience to look up some irish writers and just kind of you know not read all their works but just become acquainted with their name and what they did and what time they lived in um and then go to like a traditional pub in let's say Dublin, because of course Dublin being the, the biggest city, it's where a lot of these writers congregated, where they developed a community together and where they would meet each other in the pub. Yeah, of course that makes sense. So if then people want to go to Dublin and uh, well, go on a tour with you, where would they find you? And like, what can you do on a pub or not on a pub tour, but on a tour with you? Like what tours do you have? Yeah, well, thanks Peter. So. Uh, the website is dublintourguide.ie and there you can see a few of our tours. We do uh, sightseeing tours uh, ranging mm -hmm. from three hours to five hours to eight hours, uh, which you know, the, the longer it gets, the more diverse it becomes. So believe it or not, eight hours flies by. That's what people say at the end of the tour. Uh, we have theme tours like the pub tour. Uh, we also have a museums tour. So we visit the National Museum the National Gallery and the National Library, which are three of the most nice. underrated visitor attractions in Dublin. Really? Uh, yeah, they're not as visited as, say, the Guinness Storehouse and the Book of Kells. All right. Yeah, yeah, of course. It's cathedral. And this is generally because they're free. So because they're free, oh. they're not spending a lot of money on advertising. 
So this is a great tour to really bring visitors into these museums and show them the highlights without boring them, you know. So it's not going to be an in-depth look at the particular techniques Jack B. Yeats used on this painting. It's more about showing you the highlights and on this particular tour, showing you objects and, and artifacts that relate to Irish history. So in the National Gallery, for example, there's an amazing painting that every Irish person who's gone through the educational system knows. It's the marriage of Strongbow and Aoife. And it's just this, you know, epic painting that shows really the turning point in Irish history. So it means a lot to Irish people. So one thing I love to do is kind of explain how, um, what that means to Irish people. And so you can appreciate nice. it on a, on a different level rather than just saying, oh, that's interesting, you know. Yeah, so you get a bit more really understanding and, and feeling for what it is. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So the tours that we do, it's not about the, the information, it's more about the, the feeling uh, because eh, you know, Google can just spread out the information. Uh, tour guides have to know what not to say. And, what and how they, not to say it. Yeah. <laughs> and what they do say, they have to construct it very well because you've got limited limited time and limited attention. Uh, of we course. Of course, we always take a break during the tour. So every 80 to 90 minutes, we take a break for uh, a coffee or a beer or lunch. And um, yeah, so we have we have those tours. We have a, a tour called Sights and Pints, which is brilliant if you're coming with a group where half of the group wants to just relax, go to a pub, have a beer and enjoy their, their vacation, their holidays. And the other half of the group wants to go explore and, and be a tourist, do the touristy things and see the city. So this keeps everybody happy because it's a four hour tour. We spend the first hour or so exploring the sites, then go to the pub. And for people that want, I talk about things like the Irish language or Northern Ireland. And these are quite heavy topics to talk about. They mm. take a while to explain. So it's much easier to, to get that in if you're sitting down in a cozy pub with a, with a drink in your hand. So it works on a lot of levels. So that's the, the Sights and Pints tour. And then we also do tours outside Dublin, private chauffeur driven tours. So you get a driver guide ah. that takes you um, either to County Wicklow in the south or to County Meath in the north. So just a short trip outside Dublin. There's no need to go to the far end of the country and back again in one day. That's, that's a lot of traveling. Um, yeah. you know, it is a small country geographically, you know, in terms of the physical size of it, but there's a lot there. Um, and so you want to spend time. And my advice is, obviously, if you're coming from Europe, it's very easy just to come for the weekends and spend your whole time in Dublin. But it's, it's an even better idea to spend a week or two, rent a car and go along the coast, particularly the West Coast. Uh, as as well, you know very well, Peter, we have the Wild Atlantic Way that yeah. stretches from the north of County Donegal, where I'm from, all the way down south to County Cork. So um, that's a wonderful yeah, drive. On, it's on my list of things to do, I have to say. But listen here, th Garvin, that was amazing. Thanks for a brilliant introduction to Irish pubs, and or pubs in Ireland, I should say. Uh, I really, really hope I can go there soon. I mean, you have no idea. Me too. Me too. COVID's still going on, so all the pubs yeah. are just out of reach, so to speak. Yeah. But uh, I look forward to going there, and uh, we might even catch up over a beer or over a pint in, uh, in a pub in Ireland if you want one day. Absolutely, and we'll chat some more. Yeah. Thank you very much, Garvin. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Peter.